Just a quick note before we start this video, sadly my mic was off when we were recording. Thankfully my camera actually has a mic on it. Doesn't sound as good, but apologies for that. The audio quality is normally a lot better. So I'm recording this on September 10th, and by the time a lot of you watch it, it probably will be September 11th, and it is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Now, I wanted to make this video a long time ago, just talking about the Hassan Piker comments about this, the viral moment, of course, most of you would have seen. But because it's the 20th anniversary, I thought I'd do a bit of a longer video talking about everything I want to talk about. Talking about the hysteria of 9-11 and how it really fueled the Bush administration's neoconservative agenda. Talk about how this brainwashing of American youth into, I guess, American propaganda was really helped by this event. And then I also want to talk about the history and the question of, I guess, did America bring this event on itself? And with Hassan's comment specifically, was there some justification for it? Did America as a state deserve this attack from this group of people, Al-Qaeda? So I want to talk about all of that stuff today. I'm going to plug my social media for about a minute, so skip that if you're not interested in that at all. Before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I want to build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if you know you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. I live stream two times a week, Tuesday and Thursday normally. That is all archived on the Cavernacle Extra. And for every 5k we get a new chocolate orange, help me get hopefully two more by the end of this year. So I want to start this 20th anniversary of 9-11 video with the Hassan Piker moment. Basically, while watching a podcast of Dan Crenshaw on Joe Rogan, he basically says America deserve 9-11 for all the destruction it's caused in the world, all the wars it's fought, all this stuff it's done throughout the world, and it was kind of like inevitable. This is so insane. America deserved 9-11, dude. Fuck it. I'm saying it. We're there to partner with them. We're not there doing our own thing. We're there partnering and training in a video and, and game. equipping and, and enhancing their capabilities. So that, that's part of what we're doing. And the other part is just knowledge. We want to know what's happening. Like we, we, we fucking totally brought it on ourselves, dude. Holy shit. We did. We fucking did. In a video game, whatever, hypothetically, politically. We fucking did, man. We did. Holy shit. Look at the way that this dipshit is running his fucking mouth. Justifying genocide right now. Like, how, how, is, this, how is anything I'm saying controversial? Like, we fucking fund the people who did 9-11, still to this day. Donald Trump literally went on national television and said, they buy $10 million, $10 billion worth of weapons. So if they chop, chop, chop an American uh, legal permanent resident, it's okay. So if you guys don't remember this event, there was, of course, an insane freak out on American media, like, how dare someone say this? The clip was taken out of context with him just saying that America deserved it and not the rest of it. So I love this video. Um, Cenk Uyghur is, of course, um, the founder and he's still the main host of the Young Turks YouTube channel. Uh, Cenk's nephew is Hassan. Hassan got big on YouTube and on the online spaces through actually being on the Young Turks. So this made me laugh because Hassan is like dragged on camera, if it feels like, by Cenk to basically explain himself. And the vibe you get from this video is really like, a guy who's trying to hold his tongue because his uncle has probably like berated him and been like, you know, you've got to come on and explain yourself. You're part of the Young Turks network. You can't just say stuff like this. So just how these two are like looking at each other and stuff and how guilty Hassan looks like. It reminds me of like a father that like scolding his child or something or making his child apologizing for bullying someone. Joining me now is Hassan Piker. Uh, he uh, is part of the TYT network. He does Breakdown and, and now a new show, Agitprop. Uh, Hassan, uh, welcome. And uh, listen, you're on because uh, you said uh, some things that a lot of people, including myself, find very offensive. So uh, you said America deserved 9 11. Did you mean that? No, obviously not, especially considering the fact that while that is a very viral quote that is going around currently, 
uh, if uh, those people were at least even remotely charitable or cared about the actual truth of what I was talking about, they would understand that within context, I was simply referencing the fact that all of the foreign policy decisions and our arming of insurgent groups in the region and our efforts in destabilizing the Middle East have a direct consequence, a boomerang effect rather, if you will, in, in causing 9-11. Of course, every part of what I advocate for is against violence. Uh, I, I abhor violence, I think it's awful. And as a matter of fact, I was very frustrated with the fact that uh, Dan Crenshaw, a person who uh, four times voted nay on, on bills that would stop arming Saudi Arabia. Uh, he voted no four times on those bills, uh, it, it would, would turn around and talk about uh, the necessity for endless violence. And that uh, this simply was happening because these people this simply was happening because of uh, because these people just hated us. They hated us because they hate us. I'm paraphrasing, but I thought that was awful. I, I thought that that was horrific. And uh, in that moment, I said I thought at the very least I was saying that you can draw a direct line, basically that it was a consequence of all of the things that we have done in the region. This is not a controversial thing to say, uh, which is precisely why I followed up by saying. What, why are you guys getting upset at me? There's a live chat, there's a back and forth conversation on Twitch. For those of you who are unfamiliar, said, why are you getting upset at me? Nothing I'm saying is controversial, implying that I didn't even understand immediately why what I was saying was uh, so outside of the bounds of reason. But I think there Hassan clearly explains his reasoning that he didn't say like Americans deserved 9-11, that America did, and his language was you know imprecise, it was bad. And he was making it in response to people like Dan Crenshaw, who are veterans, but still go around spreading warmongering. And I guess using their experience to push even more wars, which are gonna hurt more US soldiers. And of course, mostly are gonna hurt the civilians of countries outside of America. But this started an interesting discussion, even Hassan talks about it, like was 9-11 inevitable? Did America, deserve this maybe like morally did it deserve this for everything it's done in the world and you know the people we fund you know america is one of the biggest allies to saudi arabia sells them loads of weapons backs their foreign policy and stuff but these are also the guys who were involved in 9 11. so it's an interesting discussion which i want to get into more you know at the end when we talk about the history to give you the overall context because i just don't want to get into that right now because it's too broad discussion. But what I want to talk about first is the hysteria after 9-11 in America and how this really seeped into the culture. So of course it goes without saying, 9-11 is just like so horrific as this event. I think I should make this clear as well. Like why it's so horrific specifically, of course there is a big, big focus on it because it's America, right? We don't care about loads of things which have had higher death tolls than 9-11, which America have often done on other countries as much as 9-11. Do Americans care about Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Do Americans care about like Rolling Thunder in Vietnam in 1965? Do they care about Linebacker 2 in 1971, 1972? These mass bombing campaigns on North Vietnam obviously killed far more than 3,000 Vietnamese people and they were directly targeting civilian areas. Do we care about that stuff? We don't care about that stuff because the whole world and the whole media is really American centric. But I think another element of it, and it's so horrific because as I say today, it was caught in 4K. You can watch so many different 9-11 documentaries and you are hearing like audio of people on those planes talking. You are hearing like firefighters talking in their radios. You're hearing like, Air Force Command talking about this stuff. You're hearing the civilians in the towers. Because of America obviously having this technology and Americans having this technology, it's so well documented and that's what makes it so horrific. You can see all the footage of this stuff happening in real time. And that makes it really hit home for a lot of people because through these personal anecdotes and experiences, you hear of so many people who were affected by this tragedy. You can really put yourself in that moment which you can't do with Hiroshima really or Nagasaki because there are like testimonies of course, but not that all of you are aware of them. You know, I've watched interviews of survivors of Hiroshima, it's just horrific and stuff. 
But that's not publicised throughout the world, and it was obviously done in a country that America's at war with. But even stuff from like Vietnam, we don't hear about the tragedy of their experiences through obviously America's own brutality. And because of America media just covering this stuff so intensely when it happened and the aftermath and stuff, these images were of course broadcast around the world for like months afterwards. So you can understand why 9-11 has such a place in, in world history, even just as the event itself, not to mention what the US used this event to justify doing, obviously, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So what anything to do with 9-11, I find quite, you know, hard to watch just because it's so awful, the stuff you hear and read about and everything like that. But of course, because of this event and the way I spoke about it, you can understand how it seeped into the culture. But of course, living in this, like, neoconservative administration, it was just pounced upon so much. And the propaganda around it just reached hysterical levels. Like, Americans love to talk about, like, North Korea, for example, brainwashing its citizens. Well, America thoroughly brainwashed all its citizens using 9-11 and its propaganda. So I want to show you some clips um, of Disney Channel basically pushing jingoistic propaganda on children in the wake of 9-11. So let's have a look at some of these clips. The flag means everything to me. It means life, it means freedom, it also means unity, and it means love. You see American flags everywhere and it just, it reminds you, but it also makes you really proud. I spent my whole life pledging allegiance and I don't think I can ever look at a flag the same way. The flag stands for us as a group of people being united and being with each other in a time of need. I saw a fire truck pass by the other day and it had an American flag on it and it was blowing in the wind. It was so amazing. Everyone just started clapping and cheering and it was really special. I had to drive cross country. We saw the flags, saw the proud to be American flashing signs on the highway. All the flags, you know, you ride down the street and it makes you feel connected like we're in this together. It's a beacon of peace and liberty and justice and democracy and we can hold it up high and hold it up proud. Driving down streets and seeing, you know, 16 houses all having their flags up high and driving with my little American flag on my car. We've all come together in such unity. It's, it's just amazing. It's so awesome to see flags on everybody's car. We're so united. We are really a United States. We should try to keep the flags flying to show that we still remember and that we still care and that we're still together in this. Now, more than ever, it's important for people like you to express themselves every day. It does help to talk about September 11th, because, you know, you get it out of you and you get to be heard. It was such a traumatic event that, I mean, how could you forget? I think it does help to talk about it a lot, because even though it was a year ago, it seems like it happened yesterday. I think communication is very important. I was just about to say that. If you had heard me last year, that's all I would have been talking about. I talk with my family about it a lot, and my friends. Tamara and I, we talk about it all the time because it's still on the news. I think it's very, very important for you to just express your feelings about it. Tell your loved ones you love them, but don't be afraid of that, you know? Um, it's a healing process. Yeah, it's definitely a healing process. Disney Channel. Express yourself. Hello, I'm Laura Bush. All across the country, everywhere I look, I see an American flag. It's wonderful to see because our flag stands for all of us, every single American. It stands for the rights of many people, religions, and beliefs. That's what freedom's all about. I wrote a poem about it. Mind if I... It's called One Man. Me is only one man. How do I stop all this hate? How can I replace it with love instead of sealing my fate? Me is only one man. How do I love? Smile at those lost smiling from above. Me is only one man. How do I give? Make yourself love one another, for you only have one life to live. Why would you cut yourself short just because of another person's actions? Instead, give help, love, and there would be no need for a weapon. Me is only one man, how do I survive? Yeah, we've had some tough times, but we're still alive. So remember, life is only as good as you make it. Us as Americans, we will make it. Let's get rid of all this anger, replace it with unity. Even just one hug or handshake can make a difference in your community. Me is only one man, they call me an American. No matter if I'm Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, or any persuasion. I 
I think through this pain I've learned a powerful lesson. That it's awesome to be an American citizen. So isn't that just the most wild stuff you see on Disney Channel? Like, I don't mind so much the adults on Disney Channel saying that stuff, but when you see children talking about like the American flag and how beautiful it is, but with 20 years distance from 9-11, we just think this is absolutely insane that you're taking, you know, this event and pushing this gross nationalism on people. And maybe some people might still say like, oh, it was a, you know, a time of crisis for America, we all do need to come together. And like the sentiment of people like Shia LaBeouf with his little poem, that's not such a bad thing. But just like with things like the Pledge of Allegiance, getting people this young with nationalism and patriotism, I think is really bad because it really subdues your critical thinking skills. And it's not surprising 69% of Americans believe Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. Because when you're patriotism reaches hysterical levels where you're pushing it on children through TV shows, apparently in a free country, then it's not surprising how easily the Bush administration manipulated people. Of course, they had a massive influence on the media itself, but it's not surprising in this climate, so many people went along with the lie that the Iraq war was just an extension of punishing the people who attacked America. Now, speaking of the Iraq war, here is Oprah basically doing propaganda for the Iraq war. Even Oprah got in on the act, featuring in October 2002, New York Times reporter Judith Miller. The US intelligence community believes that Saddam Hussein has deadly stocks of anthrax, of botulinum toxin, which is one of the most virulent poisons known to man. Liberal hawk Kenneth Pollock. And what we know for a fact from a number of defectors who've come out of Iraq over the years is that Saddam Hussein is absolutely determined to acquire nuclear weapons and is building them as fast as he can. And the right-hand man to Ahmed Chalabi. And so do the Iraqi people want the American people to liberate them? Absolutely. In 1991, Iraqi people... Are... I hope that doesn't offend you. When one guest um, dared to express doubt, Oprah would have none of it. Happen. I just don't know what to believe with the media. Oh, we're not trying to propaganda, show you I... propaganda. We're just showing you what is. I understand that. Okay, understand but okay, that. you have a right to your opinion. You That's know right. what I mean. <laughs> So how gross is that someone has like legitimate concerns and then Oprah's telling them that they're not doing propaganda? But again, this was the climate after 9-11. This is the stuff you'd see on news channels after 9-11. Now, um, there's also like an NPC, like sad montage about the new season of shows starting up and it's really, really solemn while promoting like things like Friends and The West Wing. All new episodes of your favorite shows with your favorite stars. are coming back on that day you'll join us you even have marvel comics getting in on this with all the villains feeling bad about 9-11 which is bizarre so the 9-11 issue of spider-man where all the baddies are sad about 9-11 happening and everyone comes together to clean up ground zero people will tell you now that this was always cringe but this issue multi-page write-up in the new york times and it was universally loved at the time so here you have so this shows Magneto and Doctor Doom and I think like Doctor Octopus and, and maybe the Juggernaut as well. So even those we thought our enemies are here because some things surpass rivalries and borders, because the story of humanity is written not in towers but in tears, in the common coin of blood and bone, the voice that speaks within even the worst of us and says this is not right. Cuts to Doctor Doom crying about this because even the worst of us, however scarred, are still human, still feel, still mourn the random death of innocence. When have supervillains ever mourned the death of innocence? I don't remember this being a popular trope in Marvel comics, but that just shows you how insane this stuff was. And people might think, you know, it's a nice sentiment, but when I outline to you the Iraq stuff, it's not really a nice sentiment because all, I guess, criticism of the US war machine going forward in the next couple of years after 9-11 was basically silenced in this so-called free country. And even, like I showed, children were brainwashed to be even more patriotic. But like I was outlining, 69% of Americans believe Saddam Hussein had some hand in 9-11, which, even if you know about the politics of the Middle East, would simply be ridiculous because... Who did Saddam Hussein not like? The Saudis. Who didn't like Saddam Hussein? Al-Qaeda absolutely hated him. Why? Because Saddam Hussein was an offshoot of Arab socialism. He was a, a Ba'athist and he was in the Ba'ath party, just like Assad in Syria. These parties, while Muslim, 
were more secular. And generally with general Arab socialist nations and the legacy of these countries is they hate Islamists. So if you want a good indicator of this, Egypt is a prime example where under its Arab socialist dictators, they always crack down the Muslim Brotherhood. But even today, you see with Sisi, they overthrew President Morsi, who was a democratically elected president after the revolution, because he was part of the Muslim Brotherhood. These guys, I know to a lot of Westerners, they're all Muslims, they're all the same. These guys do not like each other. Islamists and more Arab socialists or more secularists in like North Africa and parts of the Middle East, they don't like each other. So the thought that they would be collaborating to attack America is just like pretty ridiculous. And of course, the whole lies about WMDs. This big presentation by Colin Powell at the UN saying that Iraq had WMDs, they had evidence of this, only for all of these guys to backtrack on it later because it was a massive lie that didn't hold up to proper scrutiny. Just shows you how the hysteria with 9-11 was used to justify all this stuff. And of course, even with Afghanistan, the Taliban did offer to negotiate to hand bin Laden over. The US said they don't negotiate with terrorists. And then the Afghan occupation continues for 20 years after the initial war is won. But this jingoism was insane. So many journalists got kicked out of their jobs. So many presenters on news channels got fired. You know, Jesse Ventura said that, I forgot what network, he had a new deal, but because he was anti-Iraq war, they basically took him off air, but in his contract, it said he had to stick to it and he couldn't go on another radio station. So basically he was silenced on the media for the duration of his contract. And of course, even though you have these massive war demonstrations, you know, the biggest anti-war demonstration since Vietnam in the US and some of the biggest protests in all of British history still went ahead and did it. And that's because the ghosts of 9-11 really allowed them to do it. And one more thing about this before we go into the history, the US could not have asked for a better person to do 9-11 than Al-Qaeda. Why? Because Al-Qaeda and the group that preceded it is like a coalition of Muslims from various different countries. How helpful is that for your propaganda? It's Muslims. It's Muslim extremists. No national ambitions there. No reprisal for something the US did to a nation state. It's Muslim. So Afghanistan, they're Muslims. So they're pro-Al-Qaeda. Iraq are also Muslims, so they must have been involved in 9-11 as well, and you can sell that to the public easier. What a dream for people like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. So now I want to go into this a bit more with the history. Now, for my history dissertation uh, for my undergrad, I wrote about the foreign policy of the Carter administration. Um, and thankfully, even though I've lost a lot of my work, I did dig up my dissertation and found the passage where I spoke about Afghanistan. So with this little segment, I want to talk about did the US deserve 9-11 or was 9-11 inevitable in terms of did the US cause it on itself? Did the US actions throughout the Cold War inevitably lead to being attacked on September 11th? So let's go into my dissertation quick. So um, Jimmy Carter had taken steps to aid the Afghan insurgency before the Soviet invasion, on July 3rd, 1979, he signed a presidential order to give covert assistance to the insurgents, known as Operation Cyclone. It was only a modest fund of half a million dollars, but opened the door for further US intervention in the region. Cyclone only gave the Mujahideen non-lethal aid, such as propaganda tools. The Carter administration were now under further pressure to go all in from their allies, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Brzezinski, who was uh, Carter's, I think, national security advisor, also Mika Brzezinski's father, helped convince Carter that they should also work with the Chinese to undermine the Soviet government. And this was feasible because of the closer relationship between Carter and Deng Xiaoping. This greatly worried the Soviets, who'd been at odds with the Chinese since the Sino-Soviet split. In 1979, Deng Xiaoping and the leader of China visited the White House and told Carter the Soviets will launch war eventually, and it's important to coordinate our activities to constrain them. By the time of their meeting, they had a coordinated strategy against the Soviets in Afghanistan, Walter Mondale had gone to Peking on August 24th, 1978, and later recalled, I brought Deng information about the Soviet locations across the border, and he also brought listening devices and agreed with Deng to the sale of satellite equipment. Also included with Mondale's visit was the plan to build a highly sophisticated listening post on the Chinese border in Xinjiang province, which bordered the USSR and Afghanistan to listen in on Soviet activities. 
The information was to be shared by both countries. The Chinese protected the site and the Americans ran it. Brzezinski was adamant that the US should give the Soviets their own Vietnam. His memorandum to Carter on May 16th, 1980 said he wanted to make the Soviets pay a price for invading Afghanistan, working with the Saudis and Pakistanis to make this a reality. He pushed Carter into taking more steps to aid the Mujahideen. Carter obliged and his increased aid was noted in a September 1980 Soviet intelligence report, which stated that a group of Afghans had arrived in the US for military training. They also reported that the Americans had set up a training center for Mujahideen in Pakistan with about 20 American advisors teaching Afghans guerrilla warfare. The Soviets also acknowledged that the US Air Force had also delivered 4,000 chemical grenades to be distributed among the Afghan rebels. Brzezinski saw the invasion as a dream come true and he and Carter laid the groundwork which would become part of the Soviet Union's total undoing. It would be a long costly war for the Soviets and the combination of Chinese, Saudi, Pakistani and US aid and training as well as the cultivation of Islamic fundamentalism, would ruin the Soviet army. A decade after the Soviet withdrawal, in a 1998 interview, Brzezinski was asked if he regretted unleashing a new wave of Islamic fundamentalism. He responded, Regret what? Today the Soviets crossed the border, I wrote to Carter saying we now have the opportunity of giving the USSR its Vietnam War. This would be a conflict that brought about the demoralization and final breakup of the Soviet Empire. So a lot of people don't really talk about the Carter administration starting this stuff, but of course Reagan ramped this up massively, giving the Afghans loads and loads of conventional weapons, more training, of course even the famous Stinger missile, which is an anti-aircraft over-the-shoulder rocket launcher, which can easily lock on to a Soviet aircraft, and it did give the Soviets a lot of problems. But what you see there is the US are helping these guys massively and I made a whole video about this stuff before but of course you know the US talking about like women's rights today the reason there was such a massive pushback to the communist Afghan government anyway was partly because of giving women more equal rights and giving more civil rights to people so I always find that funny but of course the US didn't really care who they funded if you're up for fighting the Soviets then take some weapons, then here's a Stinger missile, here's some CIA money, we'll funnel this through Pakistan. And of course, when bin Laden was involved and when they found out about him, didn't really care about this guy. Now, people often say that the US like directly trained and funded Al-Qaeda, but I don't really believe that in the sense that I don't believe that to start with because bin Laden wasn't in Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda didn't exist until the last year of the Soviet-Afghan war. Now, bin Laden actually ran another organization called the Maktab al kidamat So the MAK, as I'm gonna call it, was founded in 1984 by Abdullah Azam and bin Laden, the two co-leaders. It would become the forerunner to Al-Qaeda and was instrumental in creating the fundraising and recruitment network that benefited Al-Qaeda during the 1990s. During the Soviet-Afghan war, the MAK played a minimal role, training a small group of 100 Mujahideen for war and dispersing approximately $1 million in donations from Muslim source via a network of global offices in Arab and Western countries, including approximately 30 in the US. MAK maintained a close liaison with Pakistan's Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, through which the Intelligence Agency of Saudi Arabia funneled money to the Mujahideen. The MAK paid the airfare for new recruits to be flown into Afghanistan for regional training. MAK organized guest houses in Peshawar near the Afghan border and gathered supplies for the construction of paramilitary training camps to prepare foreign recruits for the Afghan war front. The MAK was funded by the Saudi government as well as people like bin Laden, who also became a major financier of the Mujahideen, spending his own money and using his connections to influence public opinion about the war. MAK and foreign Mujahideen volunteers or Afghan Arabs did not play a major role in the war, while over 250,000 Afghan Mujahideen fought the Soviets and the communist government in Afghanistan, it's estimated there were never more than 2,000 foreign, foreign Mujahideen on the field at any one time. Nevertheless, foreign Mujahideen fighters came from 43 countries, and the total number who participated in the Afghan movement between 1982 and 92 is reported to have been 35,000 and bin Laden played a central role in organizing training camps for foreign Muslim volunteers. So what happened afterwards is of course bin Laden formed Al-Qaeda and the co-founder of the MAK, Azam, was actually assassinated. People think bin Laden might have killed him and the MAK broke up and a lot of it just became Al-Qaeda. So this is sort of like a precursor organization to Al-Qaeda and you can kind of see how because it doesn't really care about nationalities, it's about Islam, so that's why they helped foreign fighters from Arab countries and other places like Indonesia or the Philippines get to Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union. So there isn't a lot of evidence 
that the CIA really funded or trained bin Laden in Afghanistan, but it's clear they did train and fund loads of Islamic fundamentalists who would go on to become the Taliban. Because we also have to remember all the leading figures in the Taliban pretty much fought the Soviet Union for the Mujahideen. And in the Civil War, they were the basically the most Islamic movement within Afghanistan, calling themselves the Taliban, eventually winning that conflict and becoming the new government of Afghanistan. So I think you can easily see the Taliban as people who directly benefited from the CIA's training and funding and everything, where Bin Laden was always maybe a more minor player in terms of his influence on the conflict. His main influence came from money. He was very wealthy, he comes from a billionaire family, and it's clear that probably he was a conduit from you know Saudi money coming to Afghanistan. But these foreign fighters were inspired by the Soviet war, and probably, you know, I'm, I'm guessing here that a lot of CIA weapons did fall into their hands. But 1979 is also another major event in like Islamic history. It's the Iranian revolution, which is of course taken over by Islamists forming this Islamist government in Iran. So this is really a time where conservative Islamic movements are really, really flourishing. So you have this sort of ascendancy of Islamicism and you know, they ask Brzezinski, you know, do you care about unleashing this stuff in part? And he says, why do I care? I defeated the Soviet Union because of this. Now, why Al-Qaeda turned its attention directly to the US, despite obviously it being this massive imperial power, is for two reasons. Historically, because of their support of Israel. You guys might think Israel and the US have always been really close, but they haven't always been really close. It used to be more Britain and France, but after 1967 and President Johnson seeing how well the Israelis fought in the war, he wanted to become closer with them because he didn't want to fight in Vietnam and fight in the Middle East at the same time. So since then, the Israelis and the Americans have been far closer. But of course, because of this, the oppression of the Palestinians is obviously also blamed on the Americans, you know, a lot now. And that's something, of course, Al-Qaeda blamed on the Americans and loads of Islamist groups because, you know, the 1982 bombing of the embassy in Lebanon done by Islamic fundamentalists. Of course, you have Hezbollah being created by Iran just after the revolution to fight the Americans and fight Israelis. But then the big one for bin Laden now Qaeda is Operation Desert Shield. So after Saddam Hussein quickly captured and invaded Kuwait, people thought he would turn his attention to Saudi Arabia and he'd be coming for Saudi Arabia next. At the time, I think Iraq had the fourth biggest standing army in the world. And a lot of people, and I've done my whole dissertation for my masters on the first Gulf War, a lot of people thought this guy was really powerful, no joke, and it would be hard to match him. So the US and the UK sent troops to protect Saudi Arabia. So for the first time in a massive way, you have a foreign, white, largely Christian military in Saudi Arabia, the holy place for so many Muslims, where Mecca is, where Medina is. For people like Bin Laden, this couldn't stand. It also represented another stage of Americans basically conquering Islamic countries for their resources and sort of defile their holy place. He viewed them as infidels being close to Mecca. And because of how the Saudi and American relationship really flourished after the Gulf War, people like Bin Laden got, you know, more outrage. And then you have, obviously, Islamist attacks on the World Trade Center in 1993. You have other terror attacks in Africa against US embassies. And then, of course, you know, the most daring one, the one that just caught the world's attention, obviously, was 9-11. So in terms of if this was inevitable, I got kind of two answers to this. The US giving loads of money to some of the most hardline Islamists, who were also very militant, was always going to backfire on them. And it seemed in the 1980s they just didn't care who you were as long as you fought the Soviets. And it's pretty clear they had this view because they would fund people who would end up being the Taliban, who became their great enemies, and because they'd fund people who would go on to do terror attacks against the West and stuff. In terms of, like, Bin Laden specifically, you know, this is a guy very, very wealthy, well-educated, and for him it's like this political ideology. So in terms of causing 9-11 done by Al-Qaeda specifically, I don't know how inevitable that is from the US perspective. Like, in terms of their role in the history of Al-Qaeda and stuff like that, I'm not sure too much. But like I said, the blowback from Islamists attacking the West 
was pretty inevitable once the Soviets had gone. You're giving all these people so much money and the US are so involved in Western colonialism and things like Israel, for example, that strengthening these groups was always gonna backfire massively. And if you read intelligence reports from the late 90s and before 9-11, they were expecting attacks, not just from bin Laden, but from loads of different people. So I think the comment about even America deserving it is kind of a weird one, but that's mainly down to it being Al Qaeda. For example, if like something like this happened in 1972 and a bunch of North Vietnamese soldiers hijacked airliners and crashed them into buildings, right? And they said, this is revenge for Linebacker 2 and Rolling Thunder. Then that's a different conversation about if the US deserve it, to be honest. Like, is this inevitable reaction of you killing civilians en masse in Vietnam deliberately? and then they're gonna target you back. But the main reasons for Al-Qaeda weren't things as like, you know, hostile as that, but also Al-Qaeda got what they desired because now we think about the US and Muslims and the relationship between these two groups as something that's completely hostile in terms of like America's occupation of Afghanistan, America's occupation of Iraq, Abu Ghraib, everything like that played right into bin Laden's hands because he just has a problem with you in terms of Israel and Saudi Arabia. And he does this to you and now you come for so many different Muslim countries. Guantanamo Bay, you throw innocent people in there without trial on flimsy evidence. You occupy Iraq and create this lawless country where Al Qaeda come in and grow so strong from you invading Iraq and justifying it by talking about things like 9-11. But to conclude this whole video, 9-11 is like, like I said, such a tragedy, such an awful event captured in, like I said, 4K, just brutally on phones, on camcorders. Um, hearing testimony of people afterwards is just so awful. And because of how effective American media is, we've all heard it. And it's something you, you know, even people who weren't born then are posting about 9-11 every year as this great tragedy and everything. But I think the even bigger tragedy of 9-11 is how this one horrible event was used where you often actually see the best of American people and how they helped after 9-11 helped rebuild New York or helped when the towers are coming down and everything, you take that and then you push this extreme jingoism, nationalism on the entire population where they will go along with you on these foreign illegal wars in some cases with Iraq or just needless occupations in Afghanistan where the US justifies committing every single war crime, suspending even Americans' human rights, throwing people in a prison where you have no trial and you're just there in indefinitely. The US used 9-11 to become like literally one of the most evil countries on the planet and they justified it all with this one attack. You've killed 2,700 of us, probably rising to about 3,000 now, where we're going to kill hundreds of thousands of you and we're often going to do it indiscriminately. And let's not forget the Bush administration also wanted to invade Iran after Iraq, maybe also target even North Korea and Libya as this axis of evil. So these were warmongers looking for an excuse and they wanted to invade these countries. They wanted to push their neocon ideology of toppling anyone they didn't like in the world order to spread free market capitalism and privatization of natural resources of other countries. And not to mention how the US has actually treated the survivors of 9-11. You know, John Stewart has had to campaign loads of these people all dying from various ailments from the dust of the towers collapsing. Most of these people being in like law enforcement or firefighters and stuff like that. And then to top it all off, you have a needless 20 year occupation of Afghanistan, which the US recently left. And what happens? Oh wait, the Taliban are back. They didn't go away. You didn't beat them. You didn't even need to do this and you justify it with 9-11 and women's rights and stuff like that. But these people didn't do 9-11. They offered to give you bin Laden if you wanted him. And they're also people you funded and trained in the first place. So it's just such a mess, really. And I feel sorry for Americans that the whole, I guess, capitalist structure of America really enabled the Bush administration effectively used every entertainment or media outlet as state propaganda to brainwash its citizens. And I also feel sorry, like there's so many stories about young people who had no interest in joining the military, all signing up because of 9-11, then going over to Afghanistan, seeing how brutal the conflict is and being like, why am I here? Going to Iraq and being like, what did these people ever even do to us? They weren't involved. So that is in my mind, the brutal legacy of 9-11 is that 
in the event itself, there are so many heroes who helped avert more disaster or helped loads of people survive. And it's such like a commendable event for so many people in how heroic they were. But then the really ugly side is that the US just used it to justify whatever they wanted to do in the world. And that's what makes me angry. And I hope now with the 20th anniversary, we can be more forensic and critical of the US specifically in how they took this tragedy and just used it to enact tragedy on so many millions of lives across the world, seemingly having no regard for anyone else but Americans. And then the small caveat is they didn't even seem to care about the American soldiers or the American survivors of 9-11 afterwards, all discardable in the name of, I guess, Western imperialism and capitalist profits. So anyway, I think this video will be very long. I'm probably not gonna get out till 5 a.m. So it will be September 11th when this goes out for me. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. How do you remember 9-11? Were you alive for 9-11? If you were a bit older than me, I'm 25, so I barely remember it. If you're like, you know, in your 40s or 30s, please let me know how as a more conscious person you really viewed the world through this you know 9-11 hysteria i'd be really interested to know how people lived through this time and also if you have any weird memories of the crazy propaganda from the time please leave that in the comments as well if you want to follow me on social media at the cavernacle on twitter and instagram if you want to join our community subreddit and discord in the description and if you want to support my work check out my patreon and if you made it this far thank you all for watching